Hello, everyone. On behalf of the America's All In team, I'd like to thank you for being here to help kick off this year's Climate Week and also help launch our latest analysis, Blueprint 2030. You can now download the report at americasallin.com or click on the link below this video. We are joined today by the experts behind Blueprint 2030, non-federal leaders at all levels of society and governance and climate champions from across the US. There will be two opportunities to get your questions answered. Please submit your questions throughout the event via the chat feature. The first opportunity will follow, follow a panel of report authors and analysts, starting with Wendy Jaglo. But first, I would like to welcome Mike Bloomberg to help kick us off. Thanks, Mike. Thank you for joining America is All In for the release of our latest report, The Blueprint to 2030. In recent years, local leaders across the country stepped up to take on climate change when the White House would not. Together, cities, states, and businesses keep us on track to meet our commitments to the Paris Agreement. And now, even as our elected officials in Washington are working to take action, today's report shows that local efforts remain as important as ever. Mayors, governors, and leaders of businesses, tribes, universities, and cultural institutions are the ones testing and implementing important actions to reduce emissions. Blueprint to 2030 details some of the most effective steps they can continue to take, like setting clean energy targets, buying electric vehicles, and instituting stricter efficiency standards. These actions are good for public health and the economy and together they can ensure we reach our latest national climate goals. Of course, local leaders can't do it alone. We need smart federal investments and policies that help to support and expand work that is happening around the country. With local and federal leaders working together, we can secure a more sustainable, prosperous, and equitable future for all. So much, Mike, for getting us started. And hi, everybody. My name is Wendy Jagwam. I am a manager on RMI's US program and a member of the America is All In Secretariat. I'm thrilled to be here today with a couple of my colleagues on the America is All In analytical team, Kevin Kennedy from the World Resources Institute and Leon Clark from the University of Maryland Center for Global Sustainability to tell you all a little bit about our latest report. If we can bring up our slides on the next slide, our latest report, Blueprint 2030, is an effort of the America is All In research and analytical team, a joint effort of our three organizations, the World Resources Institute, the University of Maryland, and RMI. You can download the report at americaisallin.com slash blueprint 2030, or by clicking the button on your screen. As you're looking at your screen, I do wanna remind you to please submit your questions throughout the event using the chat box on your screen. So I'd like to get us started by telling you all a little bit about the America is All In Coalition. America is All In is the most expansive coalition of leaders assembled in support of climate action here in the United States. It consists of over 5,000 entities representing U.S. subnational government, the private sector, and civil society. America's All In aims to advance an all of society approach to climate action, accelerating climate action at the non-federal subnational level, at the federal national level, and internationally. America's All In is supported by a wide range of organizations and partners as shown on this slide. The All In analytical team would in particular like to thank Bloomberg Philanthropies for their support of this work, as well as, as, well as our core All In partners, the World Wildlife Fund, Climate Nexus, and Ceres. So this report comes at a really critical moment for climate action. We are seeing and experiencing the impacts of climate action all around us. Next slide, please. Um, from the the, it seems really every day we're seeing a new climate disaster hit some part of the country or globe. From the extreme heat, wildfires and drought in the Western United States to the devastating floods and, and storms in the Eastern United States. And the recent IPCC report that came out in August shows us that these climate impacts are only gonna get worse. And perhaps more importantly, the, 
the IPCC report highlights that the the path to limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, the, the level that scientists have deemed will help us avoid the worst impacts of climate change, that path is quickly narrowing. So really we are in a critical window of climate action. As we approach COP26 in Glasgow, the United States needs to demonstrate not only their commitment to ambitious climate action, but their plan to achieve that climate ambition. Blueprint 2030 provides just that plan. The good news is that the Biden-Harris administration is off to a good start. The USNDC released in April of this year really meets the, the scale of the need and the urgency of the moment by setting ambitious but achievable emissions reduction targets by 2030 and putting us on a path to, re to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Also notable is the Biden-Harris administration's whole of government approach to climate action, designed to leverage the full capabilities of the federal government to reduce climate pollution while increasing equity, resilience, and public health, and strengthening our economy. But what we know, and what this report shows, is that we need more than just a whole of government approach to climate action. We need a whole of society approach to climate action. Why is that? Well, first of all, as shown on this next slide, the US non-federal climate movement is massive. Over the last few years, thousands of non-federal entities across the country, across sectors, have stepped up, have carried the torch on climate action and have remained committed to the goals of the Paris Agreement. The, altogether, these actors account for two thirds of the US population, over 70% of the US economy and over half of US emissions. To tell us more about the collective impact and value of these non-federal institutions, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Leon Clark from the University of Maryland, Center for Global Sustainability. Leon, over to you. Great, thank you, Wendy. And um, thanks to everybody for coming to this event. So we're seeing all this action and the question then becomes, why is this important? So what is all this, what is all this, this all in approach achieving? So as a first point, I just wanna note that it's very important to remember and understand that non-federal leadership has been and will continue to move the ball, be critical to moving the ball forward nationally. So it's hard for us to imagine actually the Biden administration being able to put the level of ambition forward that they did without all the groundwork that's been laid by states, cities, businesses, civil society over the last decades, but most particularly over the last four years. And on this slide, we show several examples of particular ways that subnational leaders or subnational leadership has really pushed the federal government. But um, if you move to the next slide. But in this slide, in this particular report, as Wendy noted, we lay out a blueprint for an all-in strategy to deliver on the kinds of reductions you see in the US NDC. And this report is actually follows in a series or follows along from a range of other reports that we've done. First, laying out how much action is going on, trying to understand how much state cities and businesses and civil society can do alone, how they can work the federal government. And now in Blueprint 2030, we actually put together a plan that's specifically focused on showing an example on how to get to the types of reductions you're seeing in the US NDC. And Kevin will talk a little bit more in detail about what that blueprint includes, but let me talk briefly about its benefits. So if you go to the next slide, this slide uh, shows the reductions that you gain from the, from the all-in all strategy that's in Blueprint uh, 2030. And I wanna just highlight three points. So first off, what we know here and what we see very generally for this kind of work is that for these types of efforts to make emissions reductions consistent with the US NDC or that range of emissions reductions, you see a heavy reliance on getting, uh, making progress on electricity, uh, followed to some degree by transportation and then other sectors. But uh, some sectors may go before the others with electricity very, very much important in the, in the near term. Second thing that you notice, though, is it's not just about electricity. This is about every sector. It's not just about every actor in the economy, but it's about every sector moving forward. And some of that is to get emissions reductions by 2030, but some of that is also to lay the groundwork for the continued reductions that are going to be needed as we move towards, towards net zero uh, beyond, beyond 2030. And then finally, I just wanna note that these sorts of, this sort of characteristics, electricity very heavily, moving across all sectors, a lot of push on transportation, but again, across all sectors, this is something you see from a number of different studies that are looking at deep emissions reductions. But what's different here is that by taking an all-in approach, by giving an all-of-society approach, 
we have a far better chance of making this actually happen and a far better chance of making it robust against changing circumstances. And that's what we lay out in this report. If you go to the next slide. And finally, before turning to Kevin, who will talk in more detail about the specifics, I just want to note that the benefits of these types of actions, this type of mitigation from an all-society approach, go well beyond emissions reductions. They lead to benefits across society, economic benefits, jobs, uh, air pollution, health, and so forth. Um, and I will finally note, before turning over to Kevin, that you can see running across all of these an emphasis on moving towards a more just and equitable society. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kevin to talk in more detail about what we're seeing in Blueprint 2030. Thank you, Leon. So I'm Kevin Kennedy. I'm a senior fellow at World Resources Institute on the US climate team. And I was lead author for this report. As Leon notes, our analysis shows that an all-in strategy can deliver significant climate and other benefits. But what exactly is this all-in strategy that we're talking so much about? It's an all-of-society approach in which the federal government, states, cities, businesses, and civil society all play their unique roles in driving climate ambition. Action by states can push ambition and help set the pace, while tribal and local governments have additional tools to help further accelerate ambition. Businesses can play a key role in developing markets for clean technologies, both on the demand and supply side. Civil society, universities, healthcare institutions, faith groups, cultural institutions, and others, can play a role in educating the public and leading by example. These actions can help create economic and political uh, support for greater ambition from the federal government, which can then set ambitious national standards and provide important investment in infrastructure and R&D. This report reflects the need for bold action and systemic change to transform the economy and limit the impacts of global warming. An all of society approach offers the best path for delivering the ambitious action needed to meet the goal of reducing emissions by 50 to 52% by 2030 and then accelerating action to meet net zero emissions well before 2050 to ensure a safe climate future. Beyond, next slide. The all-in strategy requires not just action by all types of actors, but as Leon noted, action across the entire economy. In our modeling and analysis, we included a wide range of policies and actions with a particular emphasis on a number of breakthrough policies that can significantly drive emission reductions to meet the US NDC target of cutting emissions in half by 2030. Different levels of government the private sector and civil society all will have differing roles to play in delivering on these outcomes. Looking at the transportation sector, what we're looking at is federal and state policies that aim to phase out internal combustion engines for vehicles and for fleet owners and automakers to shift to zero emission vehicles as quickly as possible. Combined with major investments in mass transit and electric vehicle charging that are broadly available to all communities. For the power sector, what we're looking at is federal and state policies that would require at least 80% clean electricity by 2030 and 100% clean by 2035, while major electricity users in both the public and private sector would look to buy 100% clean electricity on a 24-hour, 7-day, 365-day-a-year basis as quickly as possible. That needs to be combined with major investments in infrastructure and research and development to ensure reliable, resilient energy supply that is largely renewable. There's also a real need to make sure that we're training the clean energy workforce to support community transition and ensure a strong economy going forward. In the building sector, what we're looking at are incentives and mandates for all electric new appliances and zero emission new buildings. And also prioritizing uh, low and middle income housing as we invest in building electrification and efficiency upgrades. We also need to be raising awareness of the public health and climate dangers of gas. In the industrial sector, what we're looking at is reducing methane leakage in the oil and gas sector significantly, adopting low carbon solutions in hard to abate sectors such as cement and steel, 
looking to implement buy clean requirements and further raising awareness about green products and construction practices and taking measures to reduce HFC emissions, which result from refrigeration and other uses of HFCs. And then in the land sector, what we're looking at are major investments in nature-based solutions to increase the carbon sequestration capabilities of natural and working lands, along with incentives and investments in waste to energy and sustainable agriculture. Behind this, of course, we need better quantification and monitoring of the carbon fluxes in forest and agriculture going forward so that we have a better handle on what the current situation is and how we can better improve the situation going forward. And one thing that it's important to recognize as well is that uh, it's the, what the different actors do can be mutually reinforcing. So just to take one example, looking at how to speed the uh, deployment of electric vehicles, everybody has a role to play. States can adopt zero emission vehicle mandates that help push the implementation of the, the deployment of electric vehicles, but also create the political basis for support for strong national standards, as we saw happen with the tailpipe standards a decade ago. City authority differs a lot from state to state, but in a lot of cities, it's possible to push for low emission uh, vehicle zones or to expedite permitting for charging infrastructure. And public and private fleet owners of all types can be looking to shift their purchases to electric vehicles as quickly as possible. So this is just one spot where you can see the synergies of how the action in different areas by different actors can really reinforce and speed the transition going forward. So finally, um, just the report really provides a blueprint for the necessary, urgent, and ambitious action that is needed to tackle the climate crisis. And in many ways, it's good to see the report as much as a call to action as a blueprint. We show what's possible when all levels of society contribute to meeting the shared goals and investing in a safe future. It leads not only to the necessary level of greenhouse gas emission reductions, but also to a slew of benefits that improve our communities, fuel a more prosperous and inclusive economy, and steward healthy lands for the next generation. As these transformative changes get embedded throughout the economy, they will be very difficult to undo, making for more robust change over time. But this means, first, we need to seize the moment today and make significant investments and enable ambitious and supportive climate policies going forward. So I want to thank everyone for your attention to our presentation, and I'll now turn things over to Dan Lashoff, who is the U.S. Director at World Resources Institute, who will be moderating the Q&A session. Thank you. All right, there has to be one time when somebody forgets to unmute themselves. So thank you, Kevin, uh, uh, Wendy, and Leon on the panel uh, for a great presentation and uh, did a great job on time. So we have uh, maybe a little bit of extra time for Q&A as well. Um, and thanks to the entire analytic team that put this report together. I know a lot of people were involved and uh, a lot of really great work went into it. Um, please uh, go ahead and submit your questions through the Q&A function uh, in Zoom, and we'll also be getting some of the questions that have been uh, submitted in advance. But uh, let me start uh, with you, Kevin. Um, the all eyes in Washington are on the infrastructure negotiations, the bipartisan bill, the reconciliation bill. Uh, the House did a lot of work last week, uh, waiting for text from the Senate and how things will play out. Um, obviously, you've been working on this report for a while. Can you comment on how the federal legislation on infrastructure has been considered or uh, how the report relates to the legislation that's currently uh, before Congress. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, as, as you know, we've been working on this analysis for a while and the specifics of the infrastructure package and the reconciliation package have been a bit of a moving target as they remain. So we didn't model the specifics of either of those packages, um, but 
the policy platform that we put together in a lot of ways includes the types of investments and policies that are under consideration in those two bills. And we very much see the idea that passage of both of those bills, particularly with robust climate and clean energy uh, provisions, will really be able to jumpstart a lot of the types of policies and actions that we're describing in this. One of the things that's important to recognize is that the federal government can really play an important role in helping provide the policy and financial infrastructure that states and cities and businesses can then build on in order to be able to really move more quickly forward. Um, so getting these bills over the finish line is our best chance at this point for significant climate action out of Congress. Um, and the all of society approach that we're describing will be greatly reinforced if there is robust climate and clean energy provisions. Um, and to the extent that it comes out somewhat weaker than we hope at the moment, um, then that means that the all of society approach is going to be even more important. We'll need to be able to work harder to make up for it elsewhere through broad-based climate leadership um, at the non-federal level and from the executive branch. And Wendy or Leon, I don't know if you have anything you would add to that. Thank you well, let me, good job summarizing that, Kevin. Yeah, that's great, Kevin. Thanks. Uh, let me go to a related question. The report outlines a number of breakthrough policies that are that are needed to uh, get us on path to 50 to 52 percent reduction by 2030. The NDC that President Biden adopted earlier this year. Um, Wendy, let me start with you. Uh, of of the policies you outlined, uh, are, which ones are the most important? Are there you know uh, two or three that 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 really stand out? You know, that's an interesting question. I think the thing with the climate crisis is that no single solution is going to get us to where we need. No two or three solutions necessarily are going to get us where we need. You know, we've known for a long time there's no silver bullet solution to climate change. Um, we really need a economy-wide transformation across all sectors of the economy. And what this report shows is that not only do we need actions across all economic sectors, we also need actions across all the different parts of society, all the different actors in society. So really, we're looking to all parts of society to take on the breakthrough policies within their power, within their jurisdiction. Obviously, not every actor can take every breakthrough policy that we've identified in the report, but everybody needs to play their part and needs to take the actions that they are able to take, the ones that are within their jurisdiction and control. So really looking for everyone to, to play their part, to take their actions, to, to really implement the full suite of breakthrough policies. It's, it's the package all together that gets us to the needed emissions reductions uh, by 2030, by mid-century. So it sounds, sounds like I'm asking you to uh, uh, pick among which is your favorite child among the breakthrough policies you've identified. You want to you want all of them, which which makes sense. Um, so, um, you know, in, in that vein, uh, we're, we're seeing the consequences of climate change all around us. It's uh, it's, it's pretty overwhelming uh, with the wildfires here in the West where I am and the flooding we've seen in the East power is still out in, uh, in parts of uh, Louisiana uh, from hurricane Ida, there's more storms on the way. Uh, it's a pretty depressing picture. The UN just came out with reports saying countries are way off track uh, in terms of uh, pledges uh, and, uh, that, that would get us to a 1.5 degrees target. Um, but this report actually paints more of an optimistic picture of the benefits of climate action and uh, of the uh, opportunity to, to meet uh, the 50% uh, reduction target or more by 2030. Leon, let me let me ask you. You've been working in this field for a long time. Uh, uh, are you still optimistic? And if so, why? That's a good question, Dan. Um, yeah, I am optimistic. Actually, I'm, I'm I'm certainly as I look at the U.S., I'm as optimistic as I've been in some for some time. There's no question that we have already emitted a substantial amount, and there's no question that we have, if you look over history, struggled to get where we want, where we need to go, and to, to be in a position to limit temperature to 1.5 or you know, those sorts of temperatures that will avoid the most dangerous consequences of climate change. 
But what's starting to change and what's really exciting now is that you're just seeing, frankly, frankly, what we're talking about here, which is broad-based support for climate action. You're certainly seeing in the U.S., you're seeing around the world. And that trend, I think, is the only way that this happens. Frankly, the federal government isn't going to be acting if it's not for broad-based support for action in the first place. And what we're seeing now is that across the side. So that, to me, is all is extremely exciting. Um, and, you know, for, for what it's worth, I, I think that over we we had a lack of federal leadership in this area of the last four years. But in some ways, that's really emphasized and I think given a spur to this broader based approach. So that actually gives me quite a bit of, of cause for optimism. And, and, I, and also there's a great deal of optimism in some of the technological changes that we've seen recently, which I think are allowing a lot of this to go forward. Improvements in solar power, improvements in batteries moving forward on electric cars. All of these, I think, are changing the landscape in a way that we would not have envisioned even five years ago. Yeah, that's that's great, and yeah, I I I think there's I feel like we're at a precarious moment. There's lots of reasons for optimism, and there's still uh, a lot of concern uh, that, yes. that we won't get there. But uh, it's it's good to have that view. Um, I think we have time for just a couple more questions in this session. Um, one of the questions that came in has to do with the role of forests. Um, you know, deforestation has contributed to emissions. It's continuing. Uh, but there's also a lot of, of hope for uh, forest restoration and reforestation to uh, be a source of carbon removal. What role does what, does that play in, uh, in in this America's All In strategy that you've outlined? I'm not sure what's yeah. to take that. Uh, I'll start on that. Um, definitely, sort of as as we looked in the report at the overall types of climate action, we looked at three different lenses, um, one of which was um, strong communities, one of which was a clean economy, but one of which was healthy lands. And we very much saw the need for action in the land sector and being able to do better both in terms of forestry and agriculture um, to be able to improve those carbon sinks and come up with better practices as being one of the key strategies that we need to be taking on. And we see a number of states across the country really trying to take on the natural and working lands challenge and be able to figure out better approaches. Um, so def definitely a, a central part of what we looked at. Great. And the last question for this panel uh, before we have to move on is around the role of energy efficiency. Um, it's not something that you've talked a great deal about, but it's always been one important part of the landscape here. What, what role does reducing energy consumption, uh, either through conservation or energy efficiency, play in the strategy? I can get started on that one. You know, I think energy efficiency is, is always a key solution, a first solution, the cheapest form, the cheapest energy is the energy that you don't use. So um, we need to minimize our energy use, make our, our homes, our, our vehicles, our industries as efficient as possible. And then with what energy use remains, electrify that as much as possible using clean energy, using solar, wind, other forms of, of carbon-free power. So Energy, energy efficiency is certainly still a key part of the policy platforms. We just need to be coupling that with some of the other strategies as well. Electrification, uh, increased carbon sequestration in lands among them. Great. Thank you. And thanks, uh, thanks to this panel and uh, again to the whole, uh, the whole analytical team behind this. For more details, please uh, download the report. It's available now online uh, to download. So for any questions that didn't get answered here, uh, please, uh, please refer to the report for more details. And uh, yeah. thanks to everybody. Now I'd like to welcome uh, Mayor Lyles of Charlotte. Cities are leading the way on climate action. Here in Charlotte, City Council unanimously adopted our Strategic Energy Action Plan in 2018, stating our goals of powering our municipal buildings and fleet with zero carbon energy by 2030. And by 2050, we are striving to become a low carbon city by keeping in line with the Paris Climate Agreement. 
we must continue to implement ambitious and meaningful carbon reduction actions, specifically focusing on what we need as a growing city, like equitable transit and mobility. I agree with the Stronger Together report in stating that accessible, safe, and clean transportation to give people access to livable wage jobs and recreation activities is critical to a thriving community. That is why here in Charlotte we are focusing on just that. Through our vision for a transformational mobility network, we are striving to build a walkable, bikeable city with accessible public transit for all residents. In addition, we will soon receive 18 fully electric transit buses with zero tailpipe emissions, making the air in our region cleaner and healthier. Not only will these actions reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, they will connect people to jobs, housing, and education and create connections where redlining created intentional barriers. As the Mayor of Charlotte and Co-Chair for America is All In, I am excited to collaborate with businesses, states, civil society, and the federal government to accelerate our progress to achieve an equitable, low-carbon future for all. Thank you, Mary Lyles. And our, our next speaker just was overwhelmingly uh, reaffirmed as the governor of California by uh, some 65% of voters. And uh, I will now hear remarks from Governor Newsom. Hey, everybody. It's Governor Gavin Newsom. And I just want to thank you for inviting me to speak today to congratulate America's All In on the launch of your critical report, Blueprint 2030. Look, it goes without saying, this work could not be more urgent, not only for the state of California uh, and the United States, but the world. The impacts of climate change, those smash mouth realities of climate change, they're real, they're present, they're here today. And it goes without saying, just turn on the TV, experience with your own eyes the devastating impacts of communities all across not only our state, but our nation and the world we're living in. Look, as outlined in the report, and all in climate strategy can help us achieve the U.S. national climate target and, of course, deliver a climate safe, more resilient future. So I'm proud to, proud to stand with America's All In and leaders all across the United States on, on doubling down, maybe even going further than doubling down on our commitment to climate action and transforming the way we produce and consume energy to achieve carbon neutrality and low carbon green growth. Look, California has among the most ambitious targets in the world. And it employs, by the way, more people in the clean economy than any other state in our nation. America All In has been a shining example that states and cities and individuals can step up, step in, even when our federal government would not. And of course, we had four very indelible years uh, to be reminded of that, but now, now, with the bold action for the Biden-Harris administration, we're thrilled not to have a sparring partner, but a working partner in the fight to protect the planet once again. Our climate, climate action, well, broadly, must be inclusive. And I underscore this notion of inclusivity. We don't talk about it, about it enough. While prioritizing always issues of, of justice, environmental justice, in particular. And that's why the majority of California's climate investments so far have benefited traditionally underserved communities. The majority of our investments are focused on addressing that inequity. And now our historic surplus that California has been enjoying is allowing the state to invest more than $15 billion this year to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and address climate impacts like extreme heat, drought, and of course, these wildfires, all while centering on the needs, again, of these low-income communities, communities of color and tribal nations. Look, California's proud. We're proud to lead the way for not only setting ambitious targets, but for the application of those ideals and the implementation of ambitious policy. Thank you, Governor Newsom. California certainly has been a, a leader in climate action for a long time, but it's not alone. And I'm delighted to welcome a panel of other key leaders that are uh, carrying this fight, uh, both at other levels of government, uh, other states, and in the private sector. So we have a, a great panel. 
uh, Katie Wallace from New Belgium Brewing. Uh, Katie, welcome. Um, Fat Tire is my favorite beer. It's a little early here in California to start on that, but uh, glad you're here. With us, uh, Mark Mitsui from Portland Community College. Uh, Mark, welcome. Uh, ben Grumbles from uh, the Maryland Department of Environment. Uh, Maryland, we found in research WRI published last year, had reduced its emission more than any other state uh, while increasing its GDP over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. So Ben, it's great to have you. Uh, we have Francesca Wall from Tesla. Uh, also have a Tesla. So uh, great to have you. Uh, first all electric car company that's really uh, shown the way on transportation. Uh, Mayor uh, Van Johnson um, from Savannah, Georgia. Mayor, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, so let me start this off by asking each of you to uh, briefly comment on where you see climate action happening uh, in your sector. How is it accelerating? Um, what, what, what's the most exciting thing uh, that you're seeing? And uh, let's just go in that order. Uh, Kate, why don't you go first? Great. Um, well, thank you. It's it's wonderful to be here with you all today. Um, thanks, Dan, for uh, being a fan of Fat Tire. I am too. Um, so, um, you know, I think that in, in the world of beer, we rely on a number of uh, very large systems, uh, including uh, waste collection and a green grid and transportation, of course. Um, so we're really excited about seeing some of the um, the investments and innovations lined up for the transit system and for greening the grid. Um, for brewing technology, uh, we have been uh, working in a, in a carbon friendly or climate friendly way since we started in our founder's basement 30 years ago when we had a, a tin trash can over the brew kettle that captured the steam uh, so that and it could run the incoming water by it and capture some of that heat. Today we capture over 85% of our heat in the brewing process um, and we uh, see a number of innovations um, in, in brewing equipment that are helping quite a bit. Um, carbon capture technology and reuse for food and beverage is quite exciting and, and hopefully will be incentivized further. And, um, and then, of course, just um, general uh, advancements in regenerative agriculture and seeing a, 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 a quicker adoption of that practice throughout the uh, barley farming community has been quite exciting as well. Thank you. Um, Francesca, let me turn to you. Um, it's a very dynamic time in the electric vehicle industry. Lots going on. Uh, new models coming out. You've got, you've been Tesla's been out in front, but a lot of good competitors joining uh, the race now. Uh, what what do you see happening over the next couple of years that, that that gives you hope for this transition? Yeah, Dan. Thanks for that question and for the opportunity to participate in the discussion today. I think we're we're really excited about this idea of the all in strategy. Um, on the transportation side, a lot of different things happening um, and a lot of room for optimism um, and need to continue to push at all levels, whether that's at the state, local or federal level. So we've got almost 100 kind of vehicles that are going to be in the market in 2022, most likely on the electric side. Um, but that still represents only about um, today, you know, a very small portion of, of the sales of all vehicles out there. So we've got a lot of um, room to grow um, and a lot of ambition to, to go after with the kind of target that was set by the executive order um, that President Biden put in place with 50% of new vehicle sales by 2030 to be electric. Uh, we're, we're really going to be pushing forward on that. But I think one of the important aspects that we spend a lot of our time thinking about a Tesla is the charging infrastructure side of things and the critical role that access to charging and ubiquitous access to charging will play in helping meet the EV transition, whether that's at on the light duty side, on the fleet electrification side, or even on the heavy duty side. Those are all areas where charging access will be critically important. And we've seen with our customer base over the last couple of years, um, early customers, early adopters were often single family homeowners who had access to charging in their garages um, or relatively easy access. And now where we're starting to transition to more of the mass market base, we're starting to see uh, renters and those living in multifamily buildings 
who are looking for access to charging as well. And so, especially on the state and local level, that's where we've seen a lot of focus over the last couple of years. And that's where we're going to be continuing to focus. So um, I would say the, the American Cities Climate Challenge um, has been a great collaborator on this aspect of the charging side, driving things like local building code adoption for electric vehicle readiness streamlined permitting processes, but certainly those are all things that can also be accelerated at the federal level or at the state level. level. So we look forward to continuing to think about the charging side of things and how that will help to drive acceleration of transportation electrification. Uh, yeah, that's a great uh, point. Uh, certainly uh, an area of focus uh, maybe needs even more focus than, than it's been getting uh, from policymakers. Uh, uh, Mayor Johnson, that's a good segue to you. Cities have a key role in making sure that uh, charging uh, is available to all citizens and clean transportation is available to all citizens as well as other clean energy options. Uh, can you talk about what's exciting uh, in your city? I think you're on mute. I am. I, I, I hate being that guy that's always talk, talking, you know, mute. I, I was that guy earlier, so. <laughs> yeah, I hate it. Um, but thank you, first of all, for the opportunity. And here in Savannah today, we're in some unusual torrential rain, which is, seems to be more of the norm rather than the exception here. Um, but what's exciting, Savannah, that we continue to push toward our goal of 100% renewable energy um, community-wide by 2035. And so how do we do that? We do that by making our city facilities and buildings more energy efficient, um, by um, improving our HVAC and other mechanical systems uh, through energy uh, performance contracts. Um, we're promoting weatherization uh, and energy efficiency of residential and commercial um, with a focus on highest energy burden uh, households. Um, that creates equity for us um, when we're looking at those that um, are overburdened by, by heavy um, energy burdens. Um, we're looking at transitioning of our fleets to um, EVs and building out more public EV charging stations. Uh, we're not at the Tesla stage yet, um, but one day hopefully we will be. And um, also utilizing solar on city facilities. Um, and so we're doing that by solar energy procurement agreements. Um, so um, not as far as we wanna be, but I think we, we, we're intentional about making progress. Great, thank you. Uh, ben, uh, you heard Governor Newsom brag about California's leadership, but as I mentioned, actually Maryland's done, uh, in terms of percentage reduction in emissions, uh, even more. How has that happened and, and what's next for Maryland? Well, it, it continues to be a race to the top, who can be the best, and it's very clear uh, you know, on behalf of Governor Hogan of Maryland, I want to emphasize uh, that we need to all be focused on an inclusive America is all in approach, not only a deep decarbonization of the energy sector, but electrification of the other sectors and working together on transitions that not only advance environmental progress, but economic prosperity. And so in Maryland, under Governor Hogan, his administration uh, launched in uh, February a comprehensive and very detailed plan for all of the sectors, economy-wide plan to get to at least a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, and also a stretch goal of uh, getting to net zero emissions by 2045. Um, so this focus on uh, 50 to 52 percent uh, reduction and getting to net zero depends on also being able to ensure that there's a net positive impacts to jobs in the economy and that environmental justice and climate justice are included in that effort. Uh, Maryland is very focused on that and focused on breakthrough technologies. More important than that, breakthrough policies that include everyone and including in the region, as you mentioned, Dan, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative is one of those areas where Maryland was a charter member. And we're very proud of the fact that we are, are now significantly reduced our coal-fired power plants. And we have put a price on carbon in terms of emissions in the energy sector and help use the proceeds from the market uh, for greenhouse gas emissions reduction. 
uh, to in continue to increase in energy efficiency and renewables and strategies that help protect our precious Chesapeake Bay and the lives of citizens throughout Maryland and the region. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Mark, let me turn to you. I, you know, community colleges are, are not, uh, broad, it's fair to say, one of the biggest sources of, of greenhouse gas emissions, but you play a really catalytic role in working with other sectors to help uh, drive progress. And I wonder if you would talk about uh, how you see that from your perspective. Absolutely. Thanks, Jan. And uh, Francesca uh, mentioned Tesla. There's a fantastic partnership between Truckee Meadow Community College in Tesla, Nevada, where uh, workers are, are trained uh, to become part of the manufacturing workforce there. So there really does need to be an investment in workforce and talent development in order to design, build, and maintain this transition to a carbon-free future and to make that clean, green economy more equitable as well. And so um, as we take a look at for example, electric vehicles, certainly uh, we need research to make those breakthroughs in energy storage. We need engineers to design uh, the vehicles and the new infrastructure. We do need as well the technicians to maintain vehicles. Uh, so uh, how do you repair an all-electric vehicle? What needs to be fixed? How do you do it without electrocuting yourself? I mean, those are important considerations, right, for the workforce. In addition to that, uh, with all these EVs, we also are gonna need a lot of EV charging stations, as Francesca mentioned, and who's gonna install those? What skills do you need in order to do that? If we take a look at uh, HFCs, uh, Mayor uh, Johnson talked about heating, ventilation, air conditioning. We know from the Kigali Agreement and we know from um, Paul Hawkins' work that HFCs are multiple times more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. And so how we dispose of and store old HFCs is critical. And how we use alternative refrigerants also will play a key role. That's a lot of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning technicians that have to be upskilled and retrained. And so that work is beginning. And we have a really opportune moment, moment where in the previous sort of more petroleum-based economy, um, my incentive to understand the need for climate action uh, was sort of inversely related to the dependence of my livelihood on it. We're beginning to see a change where now my livelihood may depend on truly understanding the need for climate action. And we have an opportunity, I think, to make this recovery not only more carbon free, but also more equitable by how we uh, reach out to underserved communities for uh, training and education opportunities. A friend of mine, uh, President Emeritus of Miami-Dade College likes to say that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. And with this new transition, we have an opportunity to make opportunity as universal as the talent around us while we make this recovery cleaner and greener. Thanks, Mark. And yeah, and multiple studies would show that uh, millions of uh, good jobs will be created in this transition uh, and that workforce training program or workforce training aspect that the community colleges play such an important role in is really critical to actually allowing us to, to meet these goals. Um, let, me, uh, let, let me switch gears slightly. Um, there, there clearly is a lot of progress going on, but not rapidly enough to meet our targets, uh, I think by any assessment. So uh, the, uh, the report talks about some breakthrough uh, policies that would accelerate progress. And I, I'd like to ask each of you to maybe pick one uh, that's uh, most important to you or to your, your sector. Uh, and uh, let's start with Kate. Um, so for us, I mean, I would, I would just agree with you, Dan, that this is not moving fast enough to hit uh, the current targets to avoid the most catastrophic effects of climate change that will impact our communities, but our businesses as well. And uh, the United States many times has come together to face a shared threat and protect our common prosperity and strength. And so, um, you know, world wars and Great Depression and Dust Bowls and 
Um, and so I really like the elements of this report that point to the role that each uh, sector of the economy plays in bringing this together. And I think that you know, at New Belgium, um, we're, we're big fans of, of collaborating and, and um, working with the policy sector to um, open up opportunity for market innovations. And, um, and so we see that um, happening. I think transportation is going to be one of the biggest ones um, for us. It's our third largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. And by um, supporting charging infrastructure um, and technology for over the road vehicles, um, you know, that, that affects not only the beer industry, but all CPG. And, um, and we won't be able to do it unless we work together as a system and, um, and have policies that enable market innovations, but also um, reduce the cost for businesses to adopt these technologies and move quicker in implementing them. Thanks. Uh, Mayor Johnson, let me let me ask you, which is there a particular policy in this suite that uh, is most important to you or are you most excited about helping leverage uh, even faster progress? Uh, within the building sector section, um, policy investing in building electrification and efficiency upgrades with priority for low and middle income housing of federal and state cities, we are particularly interested in focusing on again, we do equity. We everything we do. Um, this pandemic has really taught us what we should have been doing all along. It's really looking at everything through an equity lens. Um, so, looking and focusing on our lowest income and our moderate income um, households. Um, so, um, I think for us, everything we look at it through that lens, and I think that's something that we're particularly interested in. Hey, thanks, um, Francesca. Hard to pick one policy, uh, but I'll go with the charging infrastructure theme and, and the vehicle side. So um, the one of the policies is around 1 million new EV charging plugs for all communities, enabling access to all. And I think that's paired with the sort of phase out of the con internal combustion engine. Um, and so the, the two combined are really going to be uh, strong, strong signals to the market as well, um, that that's something that needs to be done. And so thinking about that a little bit more, um, we've been talking about the, the state and local level um, and how do, you, how do you provide access to all. So um, really focusing um, in on the local action. Um, I mentioned earlier a couple of different policy examples such as building codes, um, city-owned um, fleet electrification and building charging on city-owned lots. Um, but also just really serving multifamily residents. And so that's, that's the area that I, I kind of want to hit home on. Um, we get three questions from folks who want to get into an electric vehicle. What's the cost? What's the range? And where do I charge? Um, the cost and the range, I think, are starting to be addressed with the charging component to get to that one million plugs um, uh, in a cost-effective manner is going to be one of the most challenging things. And so we need creative solutions at every level to get there um, to make sure, again, to, to some of these equity points as well, that everyone has um, affordable and efficient access and that charging becomes better than uh, the traditional gas station experience, that it's just part of your daily life in order to make EVs the solution for all. Great, thanks. Uh, ben? So Dan, it's not a fair question. You know how hard it is to single out any one sector or policy because we, we know we are accelerating uh, in the energy and transportation electrification sectors. Uh, let me mention, and the building sector is a key one, but let me just mention that the natural and working lands to increase our natural carbon sequestration and blue carbon strategies is so important, uh, not only for reducing uh, greenhouse gases, but also increasing resiliency. And, and in a state uh, which is on the cutting edge of the, or the flooding edge, uh, in terms of sea level rise and storms and flooding, we've got to focus on growing 7 million trees, particularly in urban areas for the urban heat island effect. And, and really focusing on healthy soils, working closely with agriculture and, and carbon markets uh, and restoring wetlands that are so crucial to the whole Chesapeake Bay, which is at the heart and soul of Maryland. So the natural and working lands piece of it is one we really are going to use to bring 
rural and urban folks together to focus on uh, a healthier and more resilient Maryland? Thanks, Ben. Yeah, I realize this question is a little bit like asking people to pick their favorite child, but uh, I, I'm going to continue on. Shame this on you. Shame on you. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but but through the conversation, we're, we're, I think, bringing out the full diversity of policies we need, yeah. which is really helpful. So, Mark, let me give you a chance to weigh in on this. And sure. Then we'll turn I, audience questions. I agree with all the previous speakers. There's no silver bullet, but there may be silver buckshot in the piece that I would focus on is equitable workforce development to power a transition to a clean economy. And the reason, uh, there are several reasons for that. Uh, one, we actually are in the midst, uh, employers right now are having a hard time finding employees. And um, I think a skills gap could slow the transition to a more carbon-free, greenhouse gas-free economy. And I think we have an opportunity to proactively increase the skilled workforce needed for that transition. Right now, there also um, are reasons why employers are having a hard time finding employees. One is the birth dearth. And so uh, uh, birth rates have been going down for quite some time. And since the last recession, they went down. They did not recover with the recovery. At the same time that we have boomers retiring at a high rate, the leading edge of the baby boom is 75 now. So um, we do have a highly diverse, capable um, potential workforce that could be skilled up to help transition um, our economy to a cleaner economy. And these are adults working in low wage uh, sectors right now. Again, a highly uh, diverse population that with educational opportunity could help power our transition. And so I think an investment, uh, both at the federal, state, and local levels in this population and community would help create a more equitable uh, and uh, carbon-free future for our country. Thanks, Mark. Uh, let me mention again um, for the audience uh, that this uh, Webinar is being recorded, so it will be available uh, if you want to forward links uh, to colleagues who were not able to join us uh, at this time. Um, so that's available to you, as well as the report itself. I urge everybody to download that, uh, which provides more detail on the analysis and the, and the breakthrough policies um, that we're discussing. Um, let, me, let me turn to a couple of audience questions. Um, you know, one, one that I think is a really important one is about all the all the emitting sources um, that are that are in existence. It's easy to focus on the new things and making sure that uh, new cars are uh, electric as quickly as possible is is going to be important. The question was specifically about transportation, but I'll, I'll broaden it out. But we also have to uh, retire or replace or retrofit. Uh, millions of sources of, uh, of pollution uh, that are out there now. So uh, I've opened this up to anybody with thoughts about uh, policies that, that get at the existing sources that encourage us to uh, either retire uh, older, uh, more obsolete uh, equipment, uh, whether that's cars or uh, uh, appliances uh, and, or, or retrofit them. Maybe you want to jump in on that from their experience. Well, Mark, if you don't, uh, I'll go first, and you can follow me or or, uh, or correct me on on something. But I in in Maryland, uh, one of the best examples of retiring and providing incentives is through our uh, our uh, regulations that put a price on carbon emissions from the coal and natural gas sector. It means they have to. Uh, purchase allowances uh, for those greenhouse gas emissions. And that has helped, as Dan, you know, with WRI, that has led to a dramatic reduction in um, greenhouse gas emissions from the energy sector, while also uh, growing the economy through uh, green jobs and uh, increased investments in energy efficiency, particularly with uh, uh, those who don't uh, cannot afford uh, oftentimes to uh, cool or heat their homes. Um, but the other powerful incentive is to 
uh, encourage uh, solar arrays on brownfields by uh, giving them a break. Uh, you know, instead of putting at risk a, a sensitive ecosystem or prime farmland, uh, looking to waste sites and brownfields to site those clean and renewable energy sources is, is a very important and positive step forward, as is uh, generating a more attention and support for offshore wind, which is a really big deal and an important uh, breakthrough for us in Maryland. Thanks, Ben. So, Mark, do you want to add something? Yes. Uh, so Ben mentioned two very important ones. And um, another one that came to mind is uh, there needs to be a cost-effective method or technology um, for the destruction of HFCs. Um, as our planet gets hotter, more and more people are purchasing air conditioning units. And as those old units are um, become decrepit and um, are replaced, um, the HFCs leak into the atmosphere um, unless they are properly disposed of. And part of the challenge right now is there is not really good return. There's no business model for, let's say, recycling HFCs. Um, so some smart researcher, uh, grad student, somebody needs to work on that to try to figure that out. In the meantime, we need to use more alternative refrigerants. Uh, that don't have the same greenhouse gas effect and we need to properly store um, the uh, used HFC so they're not leaking into the environment. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, if I can, if I could just add. Yes, what is there? Uh, again, um, and I bring back the equity, you know, obviously uh, in municipality, our, st our, our stock is people. Um, and we recognize that although um, it's certainly the right thing um, to do. Everybody can't arrive at the same time. Hence why the discussion about equity becomes so important. Um, we, we could talk about vehicles. In fact, if that's how I get around, then obviously, you know, that is, that's, that's the means for me to be able to support my family. And so um, when we talk about that, we have to find ways to help people to all arrive at around the same time. Um, because obviously, um, you know, we don't achieve our collective goals unless we all arrive. Just some people have harder times getting there than others. So um, again, I just think, again, the equity approach, uh, as we look at that, um, how do we create these strategic partnerships to get people get to get to where they need to be? Um, some of our power companies have done that in terms of energy efficient refrigerators and, and a variety of other accoutrements that are in the home to help people be more energy efficient, that they'll give to seniors, for example. Um, and so I think those types of approaches um, help us to get to where we need to be. Great. I love Thanks. that point, Mayor. And I, I'd love to, um, you know, just highlight Grid Alternatives is one of our favorite nonprofit partners that, um, that helps to install solar panels on uh, the rooftops of low-income communities, dropping their electricity bills by 90 to 100 percent oftentimes. And GRID is using, uh, they're leveraging local, state, and federal incentives for renewable energy, as well as corporate donations and volunteer hours. And it's just a really wonderful, you know, public, private, nonprofit sector um, partnership that has changed lives for a lot of people. In addition to reducing the cost of electricity bills, um, grid, alternatives, uh, grid Alternatives also helps um, to create job uh, jobs and experience for people in those communities so that they have jobs in the, the clean energy sector after this. And so um, just like an, so many amazing solutions that leverage collaboration across the sectors that end up changing lives and, um, and helping to integrate uh, marginalized communities back into the economy so that they can prosper along with us as we work to, to preserve uh, the stability of our environment and our economy. Yeah, thanks, Kate. That's uh, one of my favorites as well. So thanks for highlighting Grid Alternatives. Great, great organization. Um, uh, well, let me get to another, a couple of other uh, questions that came in. Uh, one is specifically around manufacturing. And Francis, I'll start with you on this one. Uh, you know, the, there's the, the vehicles themselves that, that are come out. That's uh, obviously uh, the biggest source of emissions for, for most auto manufacturers. But uh, thinking of auto manufacturing, just as one example of the manufacturing sector, um, the manufacturing process itself involves uh, 
a, a, a lot of uh, environmental impacts, um, where the supply chains come from, how, uh, where we source minerals, for example, for key minerals for batteries uh, and how those are produced is gonna be a key aspect and, and whether those batteries are produced in the US or uh, somewhere else in the world has a big impact on jobs. Uh, can you talk about the manufacturing uh, process and uh, how, how to think about improving that to reduce emissions from, from, from that sector? Yeah, thanks, Dan, for, for the question on that. I think it's a really important one. Unfortunately, I'm no expert on the manufacturing side of things, but I will say Tesla brought out its 2020 impact report not too long ago, and there's a lot of details um, within that that talk about how we view manufacturing and the supply chain process and all the aspects um, of not only the, the uh, vehicle side of the business, but also um, a huge other part of our business on the solar and storage side, right? We're thinking about this from the way we produce energy to the way we consume energy. Um, and so within that report, there are several highlights about uh, how in the factories that we're building out, um, for instance, at the Gigafactory in Nevada, we're thinking about um, how to make that factory more sustainable. We're also doing that um, with the factory in Austin that we're building out and thinking about battery recycling, end of life batteries, what are we doing with those batteries? So uh, I would encourage folks to take a look at that to sort of get our perspective of how we're thinking about the process holistically um, in terms of all of the products that, that we're producing and the impact they will have not only today, but also if they're around for the next 10, 15, 30 plus years um, and how we can think about the manufacturing side more holistically. And Kate, uh, at beer, I don't, you not really manufacturing, but um, oh, yeah, but you have big facilities and, uh, uh, you know, uh, a big supply chain as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we, you know, we are a, a factory with big breweries and packaging facilities. And, um, and so I would, I just second Mark's point about the HFC transition being a really critical element, especially for refrigerated products like ours. Um, but then also um, for CPG, the, just the circular economy. And so the point in here of um, raising awareness about green products and really just incentivizing um, the opportunities for business to innovate and solve for materials collection, reuse, recycling, et cetera, is going to be extremely important when we have um, regulations at every city, county level, thousands of different regulations across the United States that are all quite different. It really impedes and obstructs any type of market solution from coming forth for, for this. So a lot of, um, you know, I think when it comes to um, manufacturing of uh, containers, which has a great impact, then there, we have an enormous opportunity for materials collection there. Um, and then lastly, I'll just say, like in the spirit of um, CapEx and investing dollars, um, you know, a lot of companies and manufacturers want to see very quick paybacks on, on those capital investments. And, um, and we, we really strongly encourage leaders to think about payback, not only as far as time goes, but as risk and, and a formula of time and risk. And so um, we will accept longer payback periods for things like renewable energy and energy efficiency um, when we have a high level of confidence that we will realize those the benefits of those investments. Having a 10-year payback on renewable energy um, sometimes or some other type of in, um, energy efficiency solution is not the worst thing in the world because we plan on being a business for longer than 10 years, right? And um, and to be patient with some of those paybacks, especially those that have much lower levels of risk associated with them um, is, is an important thing to think about as a manufacturer as well. Great. Hey, yes. hey Dan, could I, I just simply wanted to say that the, your question on manufacturing and Francesca and Kate's uh, responses, it, it just underscores the importance of sustainable materials management to go from industrial waste to climate wealth by converting waste into to, uh, cleaner energy and reducing the demand on our landfills, which are also sources of methane emissions. And so in Maryland, we have a, a our commerce secretary has a cabinet specifically focusing as one of six priorities, sustainable materials management to provide incentives to businesses to use that life cycle closed loop uh, uh, circular economy analysis so that we can all be moving away from uh, greenhouse gas emissions and into more 
uh, recycle, reuse, biogas, uh, creating energy and reducing impacts on the environment. So I, it's such an important component added with all the other key strategies. Thanks for flagging it for folks. Yeah, and thanks, Ben. I'm going to come back to you because one of the specific questions is related to what you just said is uh, about, and then Mayor, I'm going to ask for your comments as well. The specific question was about how Maryland works with local governments uh, to move the climate agenda forward. And that's an area that uh, WI has worked on in a, in a climate federalism project that, that you participated in, Ben. Um, but yeah, I'd like, like your comments about uh, you know, how, how the state kind of leverages different levels of government, both federal resources, but also really working with, with your uh, municipalities. and Which and is such an important theme in the work that WRI does and that the University of Maryland Center for Global Sustainability and, and America is all in report emphasizes is that we all have special roles to play. And in, in Maryland, we have a lot of local leaders, uh, towns and counties that are looking for strategies, looking for incentives and uh, streamlined permitting at the state level, citing decisions. So in Maryland, a local government has a very important seat at the table of our Climate Change Commission. And we are working, recognizing that we've got to convince uh, local leaders and, and their ratepayers that it makes sense to be reducing emissions and increasing resiliency. The most powerful and hopeful message that I'm seeing is not only local leaders in certain areas, but counties that are selling their climate plans to Wall Street to get higher AAA bond ratings because they have climate strategies in their counties and their bond ratings are increasing and it's saving the county's money. And so working with at the county seat and, and uh, with the local uh, government to emphasize the benefits of climate action, it's really encouraging. That's, that's fascinating. And, and of course, investors are also looking at private sector's climate plans as well, increasingly right. to evaluate right. their long-term prospects. But um, Mayor, let me, let me turn to you. Um, you know, what do you need from the state and, and the federal government to, to make you as successful as possible in, in, in moving your agenda forward? Well, I think it's very helpful, obviously. Um, policy that's consistent is always helpful. Um, funding that is transitional, I think is also help, helpful as well. I think it's important for us to be able to speak uh, the same language um, across all of our uh, governmental sectors. Um, obviously, the federal government has a very strong message that is uh, moved to the state. The state is saying the same thing. Uh, it's, it helps us in terms of being consistent. Um, oftentimes that doesn't happen. Um, and then ob obviously sometimes um, some in the public sector, I mean, the private sector sometimes get in the way of that for reasons that have just been um, been explained. Um, but I think for us, it's, it's, it's always about policy. It's always about funding. And then for us, again, we are, we're local government. We're closest to the people. Um, we're, we're the ones that bring the local, um, the local body politic, if you will, to, to, to the table. And so for us, it's important for us to, that we have those strategic partnerships, that there are policies that allow those to happen, uh, that allow us to have pipelines um, to do a variety of things. Um, and then of course, sometimes even some regulatory um, issues that the state and federal government can do to make it easier for the public sector to work with us. Okay, thank you. Okay, we just have a couple minutes left uh, for this panel. And uh, I want to close with this. I asked the first panel this as well, but you know, uh, the, the, the effects of climate change uh, can be pretty depressing. Uh, the mayor was talking about the torrential rains he's dealing with. Uh, I'm out in California where we're uh, dealing with the second year in a row of record wildfires that crossed across the, uh, the, the Sierra peaks, which has never happened before. Uh, drought uh, in Arizona, uh, flooding in New York City, et cetera. Um, and uh, it, it's, it can be very depressing, uh, but this report and this panel has been focused on, you know, opportunities uh, from the transition to clean energy. And I would just like to ask you each in, in, in one sentence uh, to say, you know, what is, what is it that, that you're seeing that, that makes you the most optimistic as we move forward? And I'll, I'll go around the horn, starting with Kate. 
Thanks, Dan. Um, I we did a, a impact study before we launched our carbon neutral beer fat tire, and um, Nielsen data said that 86% of of their focus group um, thought it was extremely thought, thought it was very important for a beer to be carbon neutral. And so I think that consumer interest in climate action, and which these are also uh, constituents of elected officials, you know, there's a very high level of um, passion place on how important this work is right now. And it's expected of corporate leaders, of institution leaders, and of our elected officials. So I really like to see the public and um, the younger generations, but also uh, a lot of the leaders today pushing for action. So that makes me hopeful. Great. Thanks. Mark. Well, first of all, I uh, note second nature of the work it's doing in higher education. Appreciate all of the leadership they are showing, and it leads me to think about what gives me hope. It's really our highly diverse student population, our students give me hope. And they're passionate, committed, uh, with an eye toward environmental justice, and they really understand what's at stake and they wanna make a difference. Great, right. and Ben, to you. Well, the, the book, The Future We Choose, is all about that positive message of never giving up. Every pound of greenhouse gases reduced matters a lot. And the students, uh, the future leaders of the world and in the U.S. absolutely understand that. And that gives us all older folks uh, more hope because these breakthrough policies and strategies are on their way. They're being developed. Great, uh, Francesca? I'd echo Kate, Mark, and Ben's comments. And I would say also alignment across um, all levels of government that we've just been talking about, along with the dedication of sort of the future leadership that's coming is really exciting and gives me hope. Great, and Mayor, last word to you. That's dangerous, but um, <laughs> uh, I think for me, um, watching a, a moment become a movement. Um, and so I'm old enough to remember at one point, this was um, things that um, they say hippies talked about in college, you know, chicken little, the sky's gonna fall, the sky's gonna fall, but they stuck to it. And now you, this small band of believers has turned into an intergenerational, intergovernmental, um, interdisciplinary uh, movement where you now have people focused on the same thing. And history has shown time and time again that people that are dedicated and focused on a singular thing can do anything. Well, that's a lot of really good reasons for hope. I really want to thank this fantastic panel uh, for, for sharing that and, and your expertise on these areas. So uh, really appreciate it. Uh, and, and now we have, a, I think, a opportunity to get more inspiration from one of my personal heroes in this field. Uh, uh, Congr uh, I say Congressman Jay Inslee, Governor Jay Inslee, but he was working on this uh, issue uh, as a congressman before he became governor and has continued to be uh, a, a national and international leader on climate action. So uh, great to have remarks from Governor Inslee. Hello, uh, Governor Jay Inslee of Washington State here. I uh, want to thank New York Climate Week and uh, America's All In for helping us kick off Climate Week 2021. You know, this really is Climate Week in a couple different ways both on the uh, issue of the urgency of the moment and the incredible possibilities open it to us economically for building a clean energy America. First, in the urgency, you know, I woke up this morning and I got hit in the face by some news that was really stunning to me about showing why we need to act. A few years back, I, w I took the last hike I got to take with my dad down in California to see the Sherman Sequoia, the great General Sherman Sequoia. It's the largest living tree on the planet. It's something that's, that moment was very special to me. It was the last little hike I got to take with my dad before he went on. And I just read that they're wrapping the tree in fire-resistant uh, material because of the encroaching fires. And I just thought, you know, our heritage is at risk. Our memories of what we want to pass down from our grandparents and parents and on to our grandchildren. This is a Climate Week 2021. We have to act. We know the urgency of the moment. 
the new scientific assessment that just came out today is showing how we have to accelerate our efforts. We know this is our last best chance to preserve what we hold so dear. But we also know this. This is the other reason it's climate week. It's climate week because of all the tremendous positive things that are happening to allow us to grow jobs in a, in a clean energy economy. In my state, in the last couple of months, I've broken ground for our first electric bus manufacturing plant in Ferndale, uh, Washington. I went to Moses Lake, Washington to look at a, a new company that has a new battery technology so that we can make our cars and trucks and our grid much more sustainable. We know we're going to be building an all-electric uh, pickup truck, Ford F-100. We are 150. We know it is a time for great movement. This is Climate Week 2021, and I want to thank you for helping us kick it off. Uh, we're obviously uh, moving in our country, but we're getting ready to go to Glasgow to lead the world. So I'm excited about this week. I hope you are as well. Let's go spread this excitement. It is a great time to be alive because there's never been so much at risk and there has never been so much we can do for our futures. So let's go build a climate uh, economy. Let's reduce our emissions 50% uh, by 2030. Let us uh, join Washington State with our great laws that cap emissions and achieve 100% clean electrical grid and reduce pollution from our transportation sector. Let's make sure that our federal leaders uh, have the appropriate ambition in the next several weeks to get this job done federally as well. Let's go get them. Thanks a million. Thank you, Governor Inslee, and to all of our panelists and report authors and analysts. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, this was recorded and will be available on the Americas All in YouTube. And don't forget to download the report and check out the policy platform behind Blueprint 2030. Thank you.